Hello and happy Teach Me Tuesday. I'm Lisa Houston, a clinical nurse educator in the NICU. And if you haven't heard my voice enough already this week, we are going to do another Teach Me Tuesday. If you've been following along on my YouTube page or my Instagram page, we have been reviewing blood gases over the weekend. So we did it on Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday. It was a little four-part series where I talked through different aspects of blood gas interpretation. So hopefully you caught up with that. We are going to join that together a little bit. The last blood gas review did talk about blood gases associated with HIE and what you can see. And we're going to talk about that a little bit today too. So it did tie together with our topic. Today, April 30th is the last day of April and April is HIE Awareness Month. I purposely placed the last two Tuesdays as the HIE Tuesdays because I do think we get a big push of stuff at the beginning of an awareness month. And I wanted to make sure we were holding it in it, holding space for it even at the end of the month. So Let's dive into part two. So let's review what we talked about in part one, and that is what is HIE? What does HIE stand for? Hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. So as we know, hypoxia is a lack of oxygen in the blood. Ischemia is a lack of blood flow to the tissues, specifically the brain here. And encephalopathy is a broad word that just describes damage or disease that affects the brain. So let's talk about an example. So we have HIE occurs during birth. So let's specifically talk about shoulder dystocia and how that would relate to HIE. When we think of shoulder dystocia, we think about how a baby's head delivers and then the shoulder part gets stuck. It's this kind of like jamming or ramming of the shoulder up against something. So imagine carrying a, a large package through a small doorway, the same idea. So a few things can happen. One, the cord can get stuck. It can be compressed between the baby's arm and the bone of the mom's pelvis, right? The pelvic bone. So that would cause cord compression, umbilical cord complications, where we are depriving the baby of this lifeline between the placenta and the baby. So if we clog it up and we compress it, we can't get the oxygen to the baby and the baby builds up in their carbon dioxide. Similarly, if the head is out, it can cause the baby's lungs to not be able to expand. Same idea. It can cause a brachial plexus injury. So shoulder dystocia is this kind of jamming of the shoulder area. If a cord gets in the way, if the neck gets compressed, if there's a brachial plexus injury, you can see how all of that would contribute to HIE. The severity of HIE can vary from mild to moderate, depending on the duration and um, extent of oxygen deprivation. So if we go back to shoulder dystocia, that's why they are always reported in seconds. So they'll say it was a shoulder dystocia for 45 seconds or one minute and 15 seconds, because the longer that the shoulder dystocia goes on, the greater the risk of injury to the baby, both in HIE, brachial plexus injury, uh, clavicle breaking, all of those things kind of coming together. So that is how that would relate in here. So there can be temporary problems and then there can also be severe neurological outcomes such as cerebral palsy or even death. So let's review about the injury. So we know it's contributing to our risk of HIE. That's what we reviewed in part one. But when we actually speak about this injury that is happening is we have that primary energy failure. So there's a disruption in energy production and a rapid depletion of ATP. There's cellular damage. There's inflammation. There's a buildup of lactic acid from this inflammation process. All that is happening in those initial minutes during the injury, whether that is a shoulder dystocia, a cord compression, placental abruption, uterine rupture, all those things that we reviewed last time. That initial injury happens, the primary energy failure. Then we have our secondary energy failure. So there is this thing that happens in the hours to days after. There are all these biochemical and cellular events the ATP continues to deplete, the inflammation continues to go up, the lactic acid continues to rise, and this contributes to the brain injury, and it actually is what makes that primary insult become the severe form of HIE. So I want you to remember this primary and secondary, initial injury, ongoing injury. We're going to talk about those a lot. So cooling, which is the primary treatment for HIE, therapeutic hypothermia. If we look at this brain that has this little red dot, 
That red dot happens from the primary injury, the initial injury. Cooling is saying, hey, injury, here you are. We're going to make it so that you don't spread anywhere else. We're going to avoid that secondary phase so that we do not have a continued depletion in our ATP, a rise in our inflammation, and a rise in our lactic acid. So cooling is not actually repairing the injury. That was a common thing that I even thought, and I really had to read a lot about this, that our cooling is not going to fix what already happened, but we're going to limit the area of injury. A baby's brain is going to continue to grow. And the idea is if we can prevent the injury from spreading, we can have this small area and the new healthy brain can grow around it. So cooling doesn't repair, but it slows the metabolic rate, which decreases the extent of the brain damage and the lack of oxygen and blood flow. Wild. It's wild. So who qualifies for total body cooling? As of right now, the evidence-based practice tells us that a baby must be greater than 36 weeks, greater than 1,800 grams. They need to be greater than 1,800 grams, less than six hours old. We're going to look at that APGAR score at five minutes. So our APGAR score at one minute might not be great, but if the baby kind of comes around, we can assume they're going to do pretty well. But if it's less than five at five minutes, that means we have that prolonged injury going on. We're going to look at those cord gases. Our cord gases tell us so much. We want that if that pH is less than seven, if we have a high base deficit, that higher that base deficit actually is telling us how long the baby has been in distress, that maybe they've been trying to recover on their own and they can't get there. So looking at the base deficit in blood gases is really important when you're talking about HIE and who is going to cool. And then we need to define moderate encephalopathy. So Sarnar scale tells us a lot about encephalopathy, but having a scoring tool where you can add up and say, okay, we're not having our reflexes, we're not gagging, we're not breathing over the ventilator, or our pupils aren't reactive, and getting a score is makes it more objective instead of subjective. So for babies that meet that criteria, they're going to cool to 33.5 to degrees Celsius for 72 hours, probably on a cooling pad like the one that's shown here. Um, cooling caps was what we initially used in the history of HIE, but now most places are doing total body cooling. They slowly rewarm over six hours. Remember, drastic changes in temperature, as we've talked about with small babies, applies here. Any drastic change in temperature is a risk to the baby. So we're going to slowly rewarm them. And then they're going to have an MRI one to two days after rewarm and when medically stable to kind of figure out how actually is the injury, how extent, how deep is it, where is it, and how severe are we going to diagnose this HIE. So I want to just do this reminder again. The stage one, the primary injury, happens immediately after the initial oxygen deprivation. So think of that as the uterine rupture, the uh, prolapse cord, the nuchal cord. Remember when we say nuchal cord, the number of times it's wrapped around. So we cool here after that initial stage so that we can prevent stage two. This occurs as that normal oxygenated blood flow resumes to the brain and it can be ca called a reperfusion injury. So we get back to those cells that were damaged, we give them oxygen and then they start releasing all these toxins. So we are cooling between stage one to prevent stage two. Primary phase, secondary phase, initial phase, latent phase. That's when we start to cool is in that six hour window. That's the importance of that six hours. Evidence tells us that that stage two kicks in around six hours after the injury. So if a baby is born in an outlying hospital and needs to be transferred to a bigger center that does therapeutic hypothermia, that's why they're usually passively cooled on the way is because we are trying to prevent stage two from starting. So a nursing role during all of this, there's going to be a lot of blood gas management. So if we think back to the blood gas review we've been doing over the last four days, this is where we're going to see that metabolic acidosis. You're going to have those gases of 709, 20, 19, where we're like really trying to get the CO2 is dropping because we're trying to get the bicarb in a safe range. And then you're going to have that big base deficit. These are the babies with... Um, 
bad their blood gases as they are that are going to get sodium bicarbonate or they're more likely to than a premature baby with respiratory acidosis lots of fluid management we don't want to fluid overlap what overload them often these babies go into pphn so we want, don't want to do too much fluid overload they might be in pain they might be uncomfortable parent education and then lots of seizure control so other considerations that we are taking in we have our medications most likely our, our number one line of defense against those seizures is phenobarm because it's a long acting barbiturate these babies might be on ino if they're experiencing pphn from the initial onset they might be on blood pressure medications such as dopa or dobutamine so reviewing when we would use those and why respiratory wise again that hypocapnia so those gases of 709 20 712 22 these babies are at high risk for pphn because we've already had this initial insult and so those normal transitions that are going to happen which we've talked about in fetal to neonatal transition are not going to be occurring in the same pattern those injuries in that risk for hypocapnia can actually worsen the brain injury. So we're going to try to prevent those and correct them. Skin, there is peripheral vasoconstriction while on the cooling blanket. Um, when the cooling first started and there's total body cooling, babies were getting fat necrosis. You don't see that so much in the literature now, but that's because we have smarter um, tools such as different kinds of cooling blankets. But it's always important to be checking the skin for that. Um, these babies, the most severe HIE kids I've ever seen are in DIC, and you are pushing fluids and pushing fluids and pushing fluids, oft and blood products and all the different blood products and platelets and cryo and everything. A lot of the those babies probably had a uterine rupture, placental abruption, some sort of bleeding emergency um, going along with it, but not always. Sometimes these kids just go into DIC. Lots of reduced platelets, prolonged PT and PTTs. So again, this is working because this cooling blanket is lowering that body temperature. The decrease in body temperature slows the metabolic rate and the brain cells and tissues are able to recover, slowing or stopping additional brain damage. So if we go back to that picture where there was like kind of like the red dot, um, any of you that have taken stable, they have great slides about therapeutic hypothermia and HIE. And it looks like kind of like this like area is kind of open. It's, it's not open, but if you think about it in the brain and if we'd allowed the secondary phase to come in, the latent phase, that area is just going to spread and worsen. So we are really trying to kind of slow that metabolism and say to the brain cells and the tissue, hey, let's slow down, let's do some recovery, let's get all this kind of oxygen and all that out, only what we need in there, and we don't need cell metabolism. Um, the evidence tells us that this improves neurological outcomes and reduces the risk of death in infants with HIE. If you think about those long-term outcomes, you are going to see the most improvement from cooling in babies with moderate encephalopathy. Mild cases are being studied more and more to see how can we help them. Babies with severe HIE, severe encephalopathy, tend to not have much recovery from cooling that they're brain injury is already so severe. I've seen this in a baby where they were born at an outlying hospital and the initial response, they weren't cooling the baby. It did take them right at six hours to get to us. And so the baby's damage was pretty profound. I've also seen the most uh, severe cases of HIE where cooling did not seem to improve the outcomes in a um, a home birth where there was a home birth and a shoulder dystocia. The baby was stuck for a long time. EMS had to get there. By the time EMS got there and then the baby got to us, the baby had had a severe compression of their cord and the damage was so severe that there was not much that we would be able to do to slow that damage. So in those situations, these are those babies that you kind of can tell when they're admitted that they're severe HIE. Remember that in a baby who is um, stuporous or has fixed pupils and is not having seizures, it's often worse than a baby that is having seizures. In a baby who has poor tone, poor reflexes, all those other indicators of HIE and then doesn't have seizures, it tells us that maybe their brain isn't having any activity. And those are some of the worst outcomes as well. I have seen babies with moderate to maybe what we would consider severe 
have some great outcomes. I remember one specifically that um, was kind of on everything. I remember the DIC specifically. We were giving lots of blood products, um, and he had fixed pupils. He wasn't moving much, and he went home breastfeeding. And it was just one of those things that amazed me that the power of what we can do and kind of affect their outcomes, it was really miraculous. So how are we supporting these babies? I always say that no one plans on getting admitted to the NICU. There are some people that know, right? If you've been on antepartum for a period of time, if you have multiples, if you've had another premature baby, if your um, ru water ruptures and you're kind of in there and maybe you have time to think about it. But with HIE, it is so sudden and this emotional and psychological impact of having a baby with HIE is so significant. The baby is often kind of whisked away. They are term, right? These are babies greater than 36 weeks. So you assume you're going to have this nice, normal pregnancy and delivery and bond with your baby. But instead, now they're in the NICU and maybe have some poor outcomes. So giving them resources such as Hope for HIE, that HIE book I was telling you about where it tells stories is really helpful. And then how can we help them bond with their baby? What can they do? Can they do touch hold? Can they do oral care? Can they still be changing diapers? Does your cooling blanket at your facility allow for holding? Can they hold the baby? Of course, not skin to skin, but still hold the baby and feel the weight of their baby in their arms. It, all of those things are going to help them with this bonding that has been um, changed from this extreme uh, diagnosis. So this rare diagnosis with no warning during pregnancy. Of course, we might have warnings right there at the end of the delivery, but parents aren't prepared for this. This isn't really something you hear about in your birthing classes. At least I didn't. No, my youngest child is seven, so maybe they do that now. Understanding the treatment options so that we can explain it to parents, to reassure them on what next steps are, to let them know, hey, there is going to be an MRI. We are going to do this cooling for 72 hours, that we are trying to prevent the spread of disease, to spread the injury. We can't repair the injury. We can do a lot of things moving forward, and healthy brain tissue may grow around the injury, but what we're trying to do is prevent the spread uh, and the severity of the damage. Having them participate in rounds and be there at the bedside as a caregiver for their baby is going to help them the most. So thank you for joining me in our second week of HIE with our blood gas in, in between. I hope that you have learned something. I will have resources on my Instagram page if you want to find out more about how you can learn more about HIE and support your parents who are going through this. Have a great Tuesday, and I will see you next week for the first Tuesday of May.